So welcome, welcome to Idean and good evening. You've all come along to an evening called B the Beta Business Makers Meetup and some of you might be thinking, what the hell is a beta business? And so I'm gonna spend about 10 or 15 minutes telling you about what it is, or what they are. Um, hint, it's this thing at the bottom here. So it's a new approach to designing, launching and growing new businesses at pace. It makes sense to start a little bit about why do we need to do this? Who's seen this quote before? Put your hands up if you have. So a few of you. Fantastic quote. It's a bit cliched to talk about this, but it's a really fantastic quote from the former CEO of General Electric, where he talks about if the pace of change is faster outside your organisation than it is inside your organisation, then the end is near. This isn't new news to the leaders of all the big businesses in the world. So this chap here runs quite a big bank in, in North America. And a couple of years ago, in his shareholder letter, he said, Silicon Valley is coming for our lunch. And so the leaders of these businesses know about all the change that's going on outside their company. They know about the new startups that have got access to, to easy VC money, can get to market very quickly, can get global distribution through app stores and can target customers anywhere in the world. They know about that. They know about the new technologies that are changing their business. They know about the new consumer behaviours. And they're spending billions and billions of pounds or dollars or euros, wherever they are, on trying to respond to that and to remain relevant. And we see them as doing um, a couple of different things. So this bit here, you know, how is it that they can protect the business of today? How is it that they can improve the customer experience of the business and reduce the cost of doing so? Here they're trying to build internal capability, whether it be design capability, digital capability, data capability. Here, from within, they're trying to create new ventures and innovation labs. Um, and then here, you know, they might be doing VC uh, investment in startups. They might have incubators. And I think all of these things are, are good. Um, however, I think we need something else, which I'll come back to. But I think typically what's happening, particularly with the digital transformations, is businesses are building a slightly better version of themselves slightly faster, slightly more digital, slightly cheaper, which is really important, um, but it's not enough. And really what we've seen with clients across all those different initiatives is that it's just really difficult to shift to a new business model. They can become slightly better, yes, and they, will, and they do need to. But for all these reasons that this huge guy in black and white behind me talks about, so this is the godfather of disruption. He coined the term disruptive innovation, so he's a professor at Harvard Business School, Clayton Christensen. And he says the reason that businesses are so successful today is because they execute a business model so well. They've become so brilliant at executing that business model and everything about them reinforces that. So it could be about their processes, it could be about um, their go-to-market, their distribution, their brand, but everything that they do reinforces that current business model, which makes it really, really difficult to shift to another one. So we think it's time for a plan B. Um, and there's a really interesting study which I encourage you to read about. So if you Google ambidextrous organisation, you'll find an article on Harvard Business Review. And a couple of years ago, maybe even 15 years ago, a couple of academics in North America, so Charles O'Reilly and Michael Tushman, did a study looking at businesses that were looking at breakthrough innovations and they identified four different organisational models that companies were adopting when trying to deliver these breakthrough innovations. So they've got the idea of functional design, cross-functional teams where you'd have a, an emerging business that sort of sits across here, and then unsupported teams over here. Um, and then there was a fourth model that they identified. Um, I would call this a spin-out. They called it the ambidextrous organisation. And this is where they were creating a separate organisation with all the functions required to go to market with its own distinct standalone leadership which was connected into corporate strategy of the main business. And they found that 90% uh, of the organisations that followed this model achieved their goals and barely any of the others did. And in interestingly, when those that had tried the other models shifted to this model, the likelihood of success of breakthrough innovation was far greater. So the idea of a spin-out isn't necessarily new. 
Clayton, Clayton Christensen spoke about it in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma. But this is some really interesting studies that have been done to you know, further bring evidence to, to that case. And there's a number of different businesses that are pursuing this in the UK and in, in Europe and beyond at the moment. So one in the auto industry is Drive Now. So in response to a change in consumer behaviour where people are no longer buying cars, um, BMW have created a service called Drive Now. So Drive Now offers access to a fleet of, of vehicles that people can use on demand and just to use for a single journey. I think um, BMW have done it in partnership with Daimler and this past week they announced a further billion euros of investment into this business. So that's BMW responding to a massive shift in consumer behaviour. Uh, a well-known retailer in the UK, Tesco, has noticed the rapid growth of Audi and Lidl, so two discount food retailers that together over recent years have, collect, have captured 13% of the groceries market in the UK. And in response, Tesco's has launched a business called Jack's, their own discount retailer. And I know a few people in the room know this one quite well because they were working at it. Um, a number of years ago, Sky, in response to the growth of Netflix, decided to launch a business called Now TV with a fundamentally different business model. So it's a pay-as-you-go rather than a subscription model. So the idea of a spin-out exists, but um, you know, our question here is really, is spinning out by itself <coughs> just enough? Just by creating that separate organisation, does it mean that you'll be successful? And we don't think that is the case. So uh, this chap here, Professor at, at Wharton, you know, talks about this idea that there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty uh, when, we're, when we're setting out to, to pursue new ventures. And it's so difficult to be right in that world. And we need to find ways to uh, reduce those uh, elements of uncertainty. If you look at a very different type of company, whether it would be Google um, or Jeff Bezos at Amazon has said exactly the same thing. Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook has said almost exactly the same thing. They see their competitive advantage as their ability to be more experimental than their competitors. The ability to learn faster. It's quite an American way of saying it. We can have more bats per unit of time. But really these organisations are saying that we can learn quicker than our competitors. And so really a beta business is a, is a new venture with a challenger mindset and there's two key things about it. So it's spun out of the parent organisation to free it from the conflict and the challenges of legacy, but it's designed from the ground up to enable it to be highly experimental and learn quicker than its competition. So we see this as being an additional response to these other four. We don't see it as being instead of. We think businesses need all of these. Businesses need another horse in the race in addition to all these things because the risk of change and the risk of disruption is so great that they need another horse in the race. Uh, we're doing a bunch of these as, at the moment. Some are live, some are not yet. And we're learning a lot as we go. And we currently have a view of a model. It's kind of a, a model that's sort of in flight as we go. And so, um, it's so in flight actually that I decided to change the name of a bit of it today. But um, within this, there's a bunch of existing thinking. So we're not claiming that you know, we're the first people in the world to have done design thinking. Idean is phenomenal at it and trains businesses to do it, but others do that. There's amazing people that do lean product development, but there's not that many people that are combining that with growth hacking, some of the learnings from management science and academia, and trying to bring it into one model. We're not going to be protective over this. We want everyone in this room to be able to use it. We want people to test it out, to improve it, to give us feedback. But this is our current, let's call this a version 0.5, point of view of how you can create new ventures and can do so more successfully. Um, so I'm just going to wrap with a couple of quick observations that we've made and then I'm going to hand over to some people that are here to talk to you. Um, we think when you're setting about launching a beta business, you need to think about you know, what is it that you're trying to separate and what are the advantages of separating those things. It's not as easy as just saying everything should be separate or everything should be new you need to think about what is it that's going to make us highly successful in this new thing that we're doing and what is going to give us an unfair advantage from our parent business. So at the last um, event we hosted, we had a guy called Professor Costas Marquides from London Business School 
who's a fantastic speaker, very enigmatic, waves his hands around a lot, runs around the stage. So I highly recommend you checking him out. And he's done lots of work over the last couple of decades looking at spin-outs. And that's something that he says. He says, you have to take, attack the new space like an entrepreneur would. If you look at it from the lens of your existing business, you'll think about the incumbency of your organization. You'll think about the process models that exist in your business, the business models, the distribution models. A new entrant wouldn't do that. So you have to attack the space like an entrepreneur. But then once you've found a space, you need to work out what from the mothership will give you an unfair advantage. What does a parent business have that any other startup in the space won't have? And so we, you know, we don't think there is a hard and fast rule on this. It's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the other thing as well, which is also borrowed from Costas, is not everything should be outside. It, you needn't spin out everything that you're doing. It doesn't make sense to. Some things will be much, much more successful being inside. And so again, there's this case-by-case -case example. And so there's this model that they talk about, about doing things separate and keeping them outside. And I think there's models there where you might transition your business to that new business. There's doing it separate and then bringing it back in. There's doing it inside and then taking it outside. So again, it's very much about being aware of the context and the situation. And the final thing I'm going to mention is really um, just to borrow something from a, a very well-known venture capitalist. And Mark Anderson is the founder of um, Netscape and now runs one of the most successful, successful VC firms. So he has got his experience and his heart and his mind and his hands in some of the biggest and fastest growth businesses over recent years. And the thing that he talks about a huge amount is something called product market fit. Now, a bunch of you in this room will know that term. A, lot, a bunch of large organizations that are trying to innovate won't. We see it a lot of the time. People think, right, once we've launched, we'll just get customers. We're X big company and we've got millions of customers, so we'll just be able to acquire them. But that's just not the case. Once you get into market, that's when the hard stuff really starts. And you only should really start to scale your business when you have a proof point that it's, it's delivering real value. And so the startup world calls it product market fit. And this quote here from Mark Anderson really sort of highlights the point that, of the importance of it. So they say a lot of the time, the you know, biggest reason for startups failing is they've scaled prematurely for finding product market fit. And we see big businesses never actually thinking about this at all. They think, we've built that product, we've built that product that we pitched to our board to get investment, we're going to launch it and it will be successful. And once it's in market, we'll just continue to deliver the features we've been planning on. But really, when you get into market, you need to think about being highly experimental and working your way towards product market fit. So that's it for me, uh, but I'm going to leave you with a question, which is, what will your beta business be? Thank you.